remain seated and we'll sing that one. children come up. Um, if you are not an able, we ask you to stand if you are able. If you are an able, as you are an able, we invite you to stand <laughs> as you are able, as we greet each other at this time. This is, 
This is going to be a good one. Lee's down front here. He's going to see all the... This is like Kmart. Uh, blue light special. That's good. That's beautiful. And it's good to see all of you running around. How do I... You know, Dad, you've got a green electric tie on. How do I get one? <laughs> Still a little bit of room. Anybody else want to come up? <laughs> Good to see all you young folks and young at heart folks here. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk to you about something that we all have to deal with at times, and that is stress in our lives. Some of you older folks know a little bit more about it maybe than the young people do. But this glass of water is kind of like you. Okay, and when you get in trouble with your parents, the water starts sloshing around a little bit. You're kind of stressed. Or when you start going to school and, and the teacher gets after you about things, you get stressed. Or when things happen like you're in an accident in the car or somebody gets sick or whatever, you get distressed. Well, that's nothing. <laughs> in the world, you will have lots of Distress. It's kind of like this. You're swinging this way and that way. And you hear in the news that something bad is going to happen. And, you know, I don't know if you're paying attention to the election, but you hear that somebody might get elected that's just going to be the end of our country, and you worry about that. And, and, and you know, you see the water in there? You see it slopping around? It's not, is it? It's holding real still. It's because God is able to help you when you're in those distressful situations, no matter how stressful they may get. He'll keep you, whatever direction it goes. Whoa, okay. That was a little unplanned, but you kind of got to go with it. Anyway, he's got everything under control, even when it seems like it's out of control. And he loves you very much. And he's holding you. And he will keep you in those hard times. Isn't that great? Yeah. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you do hold us close. And we just need to realize that and lean on you and trust you to get us through those difficult times in our lives and in the world around us. I pray for these young folks and young at heart, all of us, Lord, that you would just... Help us to understand by the power of your spirit how great is the peace that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Dan. That's exciting. I didn't know what was going to happen. I thought maybe I was going to get soaked. So we will sing uh, Sa Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. So that's on uh, 462, according to the book here. So remain seated. We'll sing that one together for the message. Savior Like a Shepherd Lead much we need like tender care <clears throat> for our use thy folks prepare <clears throat> blessed Jesus blessed Jesus thou hast bought us thine we are blessed Jesus blessed Jesus thou hast bought us thine Jesus, let's adjust. 
thanks Marie for playing. And thank you, Dan. That children's message made me a little bit thirsty. <laughs> Uh, and they talk about having, pro I eat my problems for breakfast, well, I eat my stress, I drink my stress. Um, it's good to see you all here today. I'm glad that you have come, and I trust that the Lord has something special in store for us. I <clears throat> think he's already beginning to minister among us and bless us. <clears throat> the passage for today is from Revelation chapter 20. And it's verses 1 through 6, and <clears throat> we often use the New International Version, which is in your pew, but today I want to use the English Standard Version, which is a little closer to how the original Greek was written in this passage, and there's a reason for it, but uh, it's ESV that's on the screen. So if you would stand as I read the scripture. <clears throat> Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. You may be seated. <clears throat> so this passage starts out with the angel coming down out of heaven with a big heavy chain in one hand and a key in the other hand, and he is given authority by God to take the serpent, the devil, and tie him, wrap, wrap him up in the chains, lock him up, open the door of the pit, throw him down in there, and lock it shut. And he will be there for a thousand years, it says. Now, that thousand-year period is called the millennium. I guess that's what we always call thousand-year periods, isn't it? And the millennium. We're in the third millennium now. Um, but this is the millennium. And it's what we use to refer to the reign of Christ on earth where Satan is bound. Now, there are three different major views on just when this millennium will happen and what it, what it is, and that's what we're going to get into today. One view is that we are now in the millennium. After Jesus' death and resurrection, ascension into heaven, he established his kingdom on earth at that point. And from that point on, the millennium began, and it is continuing even to today. And those who hold this view say it will continue until Christ comes back finally at the end and sets up his eternal kingdom. This is called amillennialism. In this view, the thousand years is not literal, obviously, because it's already been 2,024 years since uh, time began counting the millennium, but it just represents a long time. And at the end of that long time, eternal life in heaven will begin. A similar view to this, though, is that the world will gradually get better and better. You've heard the song, We've a Story to Tell to the Nations. 
Have you heard that song? We have a story to... And part of that is the darkness will turn to dawning and the dawning to noonday bright and God's great kingdom shall come to earth, the kingdom of love and light. Now you know why I don't lead music, but anyway. <laughs> it's okay. Anyway, the idea is the earth will get better and better because we're getting better and better and we're drawing closer to God and more and more people are going to come to Christ. And finally, when everything is really, really almost perfect, then Christ will come back and have his kingdom. So that, that also is a view of the millennium and they're thinking the millennium is now and um, Christ will come at the end of it. So that's called post-millennialism. Amillennialism is kind of in the middle of it now. We don't know how long that's going to be. Postmillennialism is that we're in it now, and when Christ comes, that's going to be the end of it. Another view, which many people hold, and I hold myself, is that, and also the early church fathers, by the way, held this view for the first three or four hundred years. All of the writings of the leaders of the church held this view, and that is that we are in a period of time now between the resurrection and, and ascension of Christ, we are in a period of time where many of the non-Jews are coming into the church. But at the end of this period, Christ will come again and he will set up the millennium. And that will be a literal thousand year reign of Christ. And the world will be set right. There will be no more floods and famine, no more sickness and suffering, no more cruel and corrupt leaders, no more tragedy and trauma. In that age, in the millennium, people will still be living on earth as we are now, having babies and getting older and dying, but the world will be a place of peace the way it was meant to be originally in the Garden of Eden. <clears throat> and at the end of that thousand years, there will be another resurrection we read about of the unredeemed. They will rise to judgment and to the second death, that is, to be sentenced to hell because they have resisted Christ and his redemption for them. That view is pre-millennialism. Now, some agree... Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> some agree... Um, with premillennialism, some think not very many think it's postmillennialism anymore. Around the turn of the century, in the 1900s began, everybody was expecting Christ to come back then, because things did seem to be getting better. But nowadays, nobody's thinking things are getting better. Um, so that that view is not so common. On millennialism, there are still quite a few people who hold that view. Uh, one thing we do agree on is the next slide. And that is, Jesus will visibly return to the earth. There is a second coming, a visible return of Christ. Every eye will see him come back. The second thing we all agree on is the dead will be resurrected in their bodies. There will be an actual physical resurrection of bodies. And it's a miraculous thing because, you know, the bodies, if you, if, if you go with burial, you know, they, they, they still break down. If you do... Cremation, it's ash. If, if someone's lost somewhere out, you know, at sea or something. But God can bring back a body that is very similar to this body, except it's glorified. And then the third thing we all agree on is there is a final judgment of all people, either to eternal life or eternal suffering. We can't all agree on when the millennium is, but we do agree on these things. If we look at this millennium and think, okay, is it a thousand year millennium? If we find that it is true, then we have something great to anticipate. If it's not true, then we should just move on, okay? So today, I want to look at it, and if it's literal, let's consider it and give glory, God glory for what he is doing and will do. In the next slide, uh, you see uh, an acrostic that Max Lucado came up with. I'm using Max Lucado's material here, and he says power. This is why he holds to the pre-millennial view. He used to be an amillennialist. His seminary was amillennialism. His, all his spiritual mentors were amillennialists, 
and he got to reading the Bible and thinking about it more, and he broke with that tradition. He still considers these great godly people, but he has a different view of the millennium. The first letter in that acrostic is P. Can we see the next slide? And P stands for promises yet unfulfilled. Things God has promised, but he hasn't done yet. Two weeks ago, I shared some of these in the message, and they have not been completely fulfilled. Maybe it was last week. Promises. Last week. Yeah, it was last week. Anyway, the first promise was the one given to Adam and Eve when he created them. He said, all right, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the earth. And when Adam and Eve rebelled against God, they gave up that rule. Up until that point, nature had been in perfect harmony. Even the animals hadn't killed other animals. They had gotten along together. Grain and, and herbs were given to them for food. But when sin came, Adam and Eve got kicked out of paradise, and all of nature became corrupted. The weeds began to grow, and the thorns got really nasty. And the beasts began to hunt and kill one another, and we became afraid of many of them. Then there was a promise given to Abraham that God would give his descendants to the people of Israel all the land from the Nile River in Egypt clear up to the Euphrates River in um, part of Eastern Asia. That has not been completely fulfilled at this point. Israel has come, and Israel has gone. Israel has come again and gone again, and now Israel is back again as a nation, but they still have never had that completed fulfillment there. Shouldn't we expect that God will fulfill that in the future? And then another promise was God, God gave to David. He said, your seed, your son, one of your descendants will sit on the throne in Jerusalem and rule over your kingdom forever. And this promise was repeated to Mary when the angel came and said, you're going to have a child and he will sit on the throne, David's throne, because he is of the line of David. And then add to this other prophecy, such as the one in Isaiah, which is on our next slide. No longer will babies die when only a few days old. No longer will adults die before they have lived a full life. No longer will people be considered old at 100. Only the cursed will die that young. Well, that's not the way it is now, unfortunately. Babies do die young. And people die before they're 100 years old, usually. And sickness comes and robs us. It doesn't fit, this verse doesn't fit the way it is now, nor does it fit the way it will be in heaven. Because there will be no death in heaven. And as far as we know, we're not sure where, if there will be babies in heaven. It doesn't sound like it because there's no marriage in heaven. And so the verse doesn't fit that, and it doesn't fit the way it is now. But it fits perfectly the way it will be in the millennium that's been prophesied, where the world dwells in peace together and people can flourish under the rule of Jesus. The next slide shows us what's next in the uh, acrostic. By the way, this is in your bulletin on the back of the prayer request. If you want to be filling in the blanks, because there's going to be a quiz next week, <laughs> you might go ahead and pull that out and start doing it. I hope you have something to write with. There, there are pencils in the pews or pens, aren't there? Yeah. The next one is O, the overthrow of Satan. And this is the one that really stands out to me, supporting that there will be a literal thousand-year reign, and we're not in it now. Because, listen to what it says in what we just read this morning, only in a different transla translation. Revelation 20, verses 1 through 3a, in New Living Translation. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with a key to the bottomless pit and a heavy chain in his hand. He seized the dragon, that old serpent who is the devil, Satan, and bound him in chains for a thousand years. The angel threw him into the bottomless pit, which he then shut and locked so that Satan could not deceive the nations anymore until the thousand years were finished. No Satan for a thousand years. If we are in the millennium now, as some believe, how can Satan be so active? You know, he's out there. He's tempting people. He's 
subduing people. He's causing people to do wicked things to other people. Max Licato says of Satan, he's a fallen, embittered, and evil angel. He wrecks havoc on earth and leaves devastation in his wake. Every war, worry, and weary soul can be blamed on him. If he's locked away, then how come he's out doing so much deception? He is still working, and we can see that. Not only, though, we have our experience of the devil in the world, but the Bible tells us he's still in the world. In John 1430, Jesus referred to him as the ruler of this world when Jesus was here. He is called the God, little g, of this world in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. He is called the prince of the power of the air in Ephesians 2.2. 2. And then 1 Peter 5.8 it says, The devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. He is not bound at this point. The devil's presence in the world now fits a literal interpretation of a thousand-year reign that is yet to come. So, okay, we've got the P, the promises that yet unfilled, the O, which is the overthrow of Satan. Then we have the W, which is word-for-word word interpretation of the Bible. And Max said, and he's, he's repeating what someone else said somewhere along the line, but when the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, we will seek no other sense. Sometimes, you know, we look at the Bible and say, oh, that's hyperbole, or it means this or that. Sometimes it's just, that's what it means. What it says is what it means, literally. And so when you look at a thousand-year reign in Revelation, you think, well, maybe it literally means a thousand-year reign. In fact, how many times, without looking, do you think thousand-year reign is mentioned in Revelation 20, verses 1 through 7. We read 1 through 6, but adding 7 on, how many times do you think it's mentioned there? Okay, option A, <laughs> three times. Option B, five times. Option C, six times. Option D, ten times. A, B, C, or D? Three times. Well, six times. So, okay, it's six times. <laughs> <laughs> it is six times. Thank you. Verse 2 says, Satan is bound for a thousand years. Verse 3 says, Satan could not deceive until the thousand years were ended. Verse 4 says, the saints reigned with Christ a thousand years. Verse 5 says, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. Verse 6 says, the saved reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And then verse 7 says that the thousand years will come to an end and Satan will be released again. Maybe we should take it literally. What if there was an example in the Bible of someone who was reading another part of the Bible and took it literally? There is. Daniel. He was one of the young Hebrews that was taken captive, along with many, many of the people, into Babylon back about, I think it was about 500 B.C. And Isaiah had made the prophet, sorry, Isaiah had, sorry, Jeremiah had made the prophecy that Israel, Judah, would be taken captive for 70 years, and then some of them would return back to their land. Well, it was year 67, and Daniel know, knew the prophecy of Jeremiah, and he began to pray and prepare for the return. So he took the prophecy of Jeremiah, literally. He didn't mean 70 years is some, I mean, seven is one of the perfect numbers, right? So it could mean a long time or some indistinct thing. He thought Jeremiah meant 70 years. And so if a prophet interpreting a prophet says 70 years, then that makes a lot of sense. Okay, we've got prophecies yet to be fulfilled, overthrow of Satan, word-for-word word interpretation. The next one is E, early church fathers. Now, an early church father, um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the term, but they're the leaders of the church in the first 100 or 200 years who established how the church will be organized. They 
they established what the general belief of the church is based on what they had from the Bible at that point. And so they were called the fathers of the church, the early church fathers, just like George Washington is sometimes called the father of our nation. Well, most of them took this to mean a literal thousand year reign at the end of this age. The most uh, significant one was Papias. And Papias was a student of John the Apostle who wrote Revelation. He studied under John and he believed that the thousand year reign was yet to come at the end of this age. Others have believed that too. One was Justin Martyr who died in AD 165 and he wrote, but I and others who are right-minded Christians on all points are assured that there will be a resurrection of the dead and a thousand years in Jerusalem, which will then be built, adorned, and enlarged as the prophets Ezekiel and Isaiah and others declare. So you got the early church fathers believing it too. All right, P-O-W-E, the final letter is R, and that goes for resurrections in Revelation. In our main passage today, Revelation 20, verses 4 and 5, John saw thrones where people were seated who had authority to rule. And it says he also saw those who had been killed during the tribulation, meaning they were beheaded during the tribulation for their testimony to Jesus, and also those who were there who didn't bow to the Antichrist. And I quote what he says at the end of verse 4 about those that had been killed in the tribulation. He said, they all came to life again, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now, we'll get into this more. I believe the people that were seated on the thrones, the ones seated on the thrones, may have been the people who have died in Christ since, his, since the church began. I'm not sure. It might be angels. One, one writer says it's angels. But then there are all these martyrs, and that's the first resurrection. They came to life again, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. In verse 5, he says, this is the first resurrection, and blessed are those who find themselves in that resurrection. For the second resurrection, the resurrection unto death, will have no power on them. He says at the end of the thousand years, though, there will be a resurrection of the rest of the people. That means those who have rebelled and not repented, who are sinners, and they will be resurrected, and they will be judged, and they will be delivered to their punishment. They had opportunity to turn to God, and yet they refused, and they bear the consequences of it. So if there's no millennium, then how do you have two resurrections, one at the beginning of the millennium and one at the end of the millennium? So that's another reason to believe that there is the thousand-year literal millennium. Okay, I want to close on a happy note today, um, and that is whether we understand this perfectly or not, we know that a great future is coming. Right now we live with problems around us. The world is broken. People are born with physical problems. As we grow older, we run into illnesses and diseases. We have broken relationships because we're imperfect in relating to one another. It's a hard time. Wars arise. If, if America <laughs> turns a corner, who knows what our future here will hold. But all these things are going to pass away because God's great kingdom is coming to earth. But it's not done by us. It's him coming down and establishing it. And there will be no more dying, no more sickness, none of that. We will live in glory. And it tells us that there will be a city of God coming down from heaven to earth. That's the connection between heaven and earth. It's the new Jerusalem. And it's full of wealth and culture and beauty. And God is there. And people can meet with him there. And out from Jerusalem, all across the wide world, there will be adventures and wonders for us to enjoy. Mountains to climb, rivers to swim in, beaches to luxuriate on, um, things to explore, things to do, and meadows and forests with no mosquitoes and no chiggers and no thorns and friendly animals. And it'll be ours, a gift from God, what he has for us. 
And we can look forward to that. And there will be no presence of the devil there. I'd like you also today, if you can, to take time and read the final three chapters of Revelation. Just go to the back of your Bible and a couple pages back from there, forward from there. Chapters 20, 21, and 22. And see if you don't get thrilled thinking about what God has in store for you in heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for heaven. You've prepared it for us. You've promised it to us, and you are faithful, and you will not break your promises. You've made us worthy of it through Jesus Christ, not through ourselves, because if it was up to us, we would fail utterly. But because of Jesus Christ, we can stand before you clothed in his righteousness and be judged worthy to enter your kingdom. Lord, encourage us with that thought. Help us to go forward through whatever lies before us in the next days and weeks, months and years. And may we give you praise and glory and honor because of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as Gary and Marie come, I would like to introduce the song we're going to sing. One of the most loved Christmas carols is Joy to the World, written by Isaac Watts. But, you know, he wasn't writing about Christmas. He was writing about the millennium. It's described in Psalm 98. And Gary is going to lead us in this song. And so as you sing it, think about what he's saying about what it's going to be like when Christ is reigning and see how it fits so well with the millennium. Okay. You know, that's something because I thought myself, just, I'm glad he's came, because I said, well, this is a Christmas song we're going to be singing here, right, even before November. Well, then I quickly looked at what he was saying there, Joy to the World, and it was just, this is about, this is a Revelation song. Mm-hmm. It's pretty, yeah, no, look at it, you just pay attention. Okay, you can uh, remain seated while we sing hymn number 125, Joy to the World. saying that for years and that, and that just put that together right together with us. good job <laughs> good job dad good job well even if it was written for a different time you can enjoy it at oh, christmas time yeah. just like you enjoy handel's messiah well, right. which was written for easter <laughs> believe it or not but <clears throat> I think Christian, um, Christmas is just like this giant vacuum cleaner that pulls in all the warm, good thoughts throughout the year and consolidates it then. 
<clears throat> well, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer now. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you've given us. We praise you. We worship you together here today. Each one of us, Lord, we ask that your spirit would be moving among us and that we would, in turn, reflect back to you all the glory and praise and honor that you deserve. Thank you that we can sing songs uh, any time in the year that praise you, especially like Joy to the World and others that we sang this morning. And it's just wonderful, Lord, to be able to gather together and join together either with our voices or if we're just kind of silently listening or humming along in praising you. Lord, we have many concerns that we want to lift before you today. We see increasing conflict in the Middle East, and we know that that's a powder keg that could turn into a worldwide problem. It already is a terrible problem for those that are there. We pray for your hand in this matter to accomplish your will and be with those who are suffering. We think of our nation and things that are coming up in the future, especially the election next week. We pray for peace on the day after the election, too. We pray that your will would be done, that you would work through our leaders, whoever they are, whatever position they have, to establish truth and justice and righteousness throughout this land. And Lord, turn many people back to you. May they give their lives in worship of you and service of you and have their sins forgiven and be there in heaven when we are forever in your presence. We ask you that you would continue to bless the Alpha Course. Thank you for this Alpha Day that we had yesterday and how you were present there with us and using it in our lives. We thank you for the Midwest Conference and for the ministry staff, for Lexi and David and Brandy, Lori, Carla, Oscar, Jim and Amy, and how they make things happen for us here in New Gotland and other churches around these five states. We want to lift before you Joel, the two-week-old neighbor of Clayton and Sarah, uh, and what he's going through, Lord. We pray that you would just fight off this infection, help him to heal and to have a great life, Lord, and help him to get over the things that are done to fight off the meningitis, because that's also causing challenges for his body. May he be healthy, Lord. Be with his family and the, the distresses it's putting them through and the having to figure out what to do with their other kids and their pets and everything. We pray for Carly, that you would help her as she is going to be taking the chemo treatment soon. We ask that it would be very effective against the cancer, Lord, that you would also strengthen her body in every way, in the cellular level. May she resist the damage of it to her healthy cells. Be with the family, standing around and encouraging her, and give them peace too. And Lee Ray is... His abdominal issues are causing him lots of trouble these days, and some of the treatment is causing trouble. We just ask that he would be able to rest at night and, and feel refreshed in the morning, and that his, the leg swelling would go down and other issues that he's having. And be with him as he anticipates the surgery, too. May that be successful, Lord. We pray for Vern as he's dealing with a lot of pain from his cancer and numbness in his legs and, and having trouble walking. Thank you that he's here today, Lord. We pray that you would watch over him and take care of him and bless him and Jennifer as well as she stands beside him. And William, as he continues to recover from his heart procedure and, and is looking at other things in the future regarding that, continue to strengthen Mary and Edward King in the hospice, help him, and Dean Brunsell, the treatment for cancer, and Eldon and his gallbladder. Thank you that he's doing better, Lord, and and that uh, <clears throat> it's no longer bothering him like it was. And Dwight's son, Levi, help him to continue to heal. It may still be a long road ahead of him. And Dwight, too, bless him and help him. And Chris Sandow, her medical needs, and the, <laughs> the move to Kansas City has been frustrated. Her, her request has been denied, and she's wondering what to do next. Just give her wisdom and give her son, Dan, wisdom as he works with her to figure it out. Be with Kathy's sister, Mercedes, and her stage four cancer. And Lord Delbert Hunt, Lee Ray's secretary's husband, just recently discovered that he has non-Hodgkin's leukemia, that, or lymphoma, 
not leukemia, lymphoma, that is spread throughout his system. And he's a relatively young man. We pray that you would bring healing to him and comfort to him and his wife in this time. And Lord, we lift before you now our unspoken requests. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing and answering. In your name, amen. <clears throat> well, it's time for us to worship the Lord in giving. And the passage that I'd like to bring to your attention is, is from Psalm 1. And it's just a, a passage about how God blesses those who seek him. And we seek him through praying to him, reading his word, spending time each day in relationship, coming together in worship, and also in our, our tithes and our offerings. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Ushers, would you please come forward? Let's pray. Lord, once again, we thank you for your bounty to us. Thank you for helping us to be like the trees planted by streams of water whose leaves do not wither and produce, who produces fruit in its season. Pray your blessing on us, and Lord, out of gratitude to you, we give back part of what you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Christian soldiers. So remember, we have our uh, meal right afterwards. So sing with me. One uh, uh, four seventy nine. Your hymn. So. Christ the Royal Master 
was a fun song. Yeah, it would get you going. <laughs> Marie was really getting into it. Well, praise the Lord. He's recruited us into his army. Well, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit remain with you now and forever. Amen.